avoid it. Anyway, so we're talking about Windows profiles, right? And particularly in Citrix environments. What is what is the Windows user profile, right? Well, the profile kind of exists at the intersection of applications and data and config items, right? And it's everything that ties this together and it creates a part of the user experience. It's everything kind of specific to the user session that handles those users' personalized settings, right? So you've got things like view settings, display settings, shortcuts, wallpapers, screen servers, color schemes, config items, dictionaries, signatures, autocompletes, cookies, history, all sorts of stuff, right? There's all sorts of stuff that gets banged into the Windows user profile. Now, what a lot of people tend to kind of forget is how significant the user profile can be, right? It's often something that people kind of relegate in terms of their priorities but not so long ago well actually about five years or so ago so it's pretty long in it terms i did a windows 10 migration for about nineteen thousand users and as part of this migration i ended up doing kind of like a breakdown of all of the the, the, the kind of help desk calls that we got related to the migration uh 22 percent of them were tied to the speed of log on 15 percent of them were tied to file type associations, which anybody who's done a Windows 10 migration can probably identify with that, that sort of pain. 5% of them were to do with the loss of view settings, which were lost or incorrect. Now, these were both pre and post migration issues that kind of came out as part of the migration. But the fact of the matter is that statistically wise, right, 41% of the support calls that we had during that Windows 10 migration could be tied to user profile issues so all these people who are saying yeah we, we worry about the profile not so much right there is quite a lot of stuff that comes out of it and you know the user's profile probably doesn't get as much attention as it should from some people although as we'll touch on in a bit right maybe it's becoming a bit less important as we move on but i think you know we really need to consider it when we're trying to provide users with a smooth user experience so where did user profiles come about, right? Well, if you're as old and as great as, uh, as me, right, you can probably remember like back in early versions of Windows, like 3.11, you didn't even have anything like a user profile, right? If like me, I used to share a machine with a woman in the marketing department and any changes you made in your session, right? The next time the user came along to use the machine, they'd have to put up with all of the changes that you'd made. Like we say here, the infamous hot dog stand color scheme from Windows 3.11, which I actually quite liked. And the woman who shared the machine with me probably didn't like them she probably wanted to kill me um at the very least to give me you know just straight execution for changing our desktop to things like that and i wasn't just averse to that i used to bring in screen servers on discs and things like that and all sorts of um annoying stuff but as we got on to windows nt right 3.11 and version 4 we actually and there's my wife ringing me and she knows i'm doing a session so she's going to be in trouble when i get home um they introduced the concept of a user profile where you had a user could log on to a shared machine they could actually authenticate as themselves which is another kind of newish sort of thing and then have the user specific settings stored so i mean they evolved over different versions of windows but the basic premise as you can see here right the user had a set of folders and a registry hive, which was ntuser.dat. These persisted around with the user, right? They had shared settings that went into all users and a user profile variable to map to it. As I said, they changed around over time, but this is where it came along from. And we had um, four different types of user profile as well right i mean there are maybe more depending on how you skin it but for base windows there are four types you've got a local profile that's just stored locally to the machine so it's stored only on the device and it doesn't go anywhere with the user you've also got a um, roaming profile which is something that's copied down to a file server share and copied back to the device at logon you know which allows users to persist their changes and which is defined in ad You've got a mandatory profile, which is kind of like a roaming profile for like chaos machines and things like that, which is not saved back to the file share and it's discarded at log off. You also have a thing called a super mandatory profile as well, but it's just a, a, an evolution of the same one. And obviously there's a temporary profile you can have as well. So if you know there's a problem loading a profile or the user's profile is unavailable, then the user the system creates a, um, a profile for them, which is then discarded at log off. Now we have got a thing that people refer to called a hybrid profile as well, but that's not really a native Windows thing. And that's more something we'll talk more about in a bit. 
And just on the final bit about profiles, we do have as Windows evolved, right? We've got different versions, right? The latest profile version, which has existed since Windows 10, 16, or 7 and Server 2016, is version 6 profile. Now, the important thing to know about these different profile versions is that it can be upgraded, but they can never be downgraded. So you can do like a, a one time migrate of a downstream, a downstream profile version to the latest, but you can't go back and you can't share different profile versions across operating systems. You can try, um, but you'll, you will have some issues. So back in the day, right, really when we were in non-persistent environments like Citrix environments, the roaming profile was the only option we had, right? A user logged in, um, I think we've got a bit of a diagram to go through it here. There's a machine there. The user comes along, logs onto the machine. It then goes to the file share where the profile path defined. That gets copied down onto the machine. When they log off at the end of the session, it's copied back to the file share, right? It's pretty rudimentary, but it's simple enough, right? But obviously, there were obvious drawbacks to this. And large files, um, and particularly large numbers of small files, I mean, if you want to break a machine, right, give it a roaming profile folder. Put about 10,000 one kilobyte files inside a folder in there, and then log on and say what happens. I wouldn't recommend doing it. So both large files and large folders can have a really detrimental effect on the log on and log off performance. Now, there's also the issue that roaming profiles only capture the app data roaming folder and ignore the other folders in app data which are app data local and app data local law and they often contain a lot of data that the user uses i know you can registry hack around this but it's messy and it's probably unsupported as well so what happened was people simply coupled roaming profiles together with folder redirection, right, to get around the log on, log off issues. So instead of having those big sort of folders within there stored in the user profile and copied up and down, they were simply redirected to a network file share and accessed kind of a bit like through a window onto the network, which reduced the problem of the log on and log off times. But unfortunately, it just introduced problems of its own, right? We simply replace, I mean, in some cases, it broke some applications, especially if you're redirecting things like the update folder. And you, often you just replace those drags at log on with poor in session performance, right? And I mean, even today, even on like high performance SMB shares, redirection of specific folders, the one that I say a lot of is the desktop folder, which is commonly done in Citrix environments, can have a detrimental effect on session performance, and that impacts badly on your user experience. And even Citrix UPM, right, in its early days, which was kind of just a roaming profile on steroids back in the day, that was often used in conjunction with very aggressive folder redirection, and it brought along a lot of issues of its own. So when these sort of issues came along, um, we basically you know, we saw a lot of movement in the virtual apps and desktops industry towards things like AppSense, which became Avanti. There were others like Rares and Sense and things like that. But Avanti was arguably the leader in this trend for a time, right? I saw it in lots and lots of Citrix deployments. And the concept behind the, the kind of Avanti model was that instead of copying in and out all of the settings that a user required to log on and log off and having lots of redirections to back it up, the user settings were applied kind of just in time, right? So they were only injected into the user session as the applications and the operating system required them. And they weren't copied from SMB shares. They're actually streamed via HTTP from an SQL database in the background, you know, which ran through a web server. And they were saved into a virtual session. So each application essentially had its own independent settings. Now, this avoided a lot of the issues associated with application instability and session performance that we'd seen from these earlier methods of profile management. However, as you can probably tell from the diagram showing this, it's not without its drawbacks. For one, it's very complicated. It also had a cost attached to it as well. And besides the personalization aspect, right, which was complicated enough on its own, Eventy also has a load of other tooling that you can use to do some admittedly cool things which require a lot of maintenance and resource to keep it running. And one of my biggest gripes with the Avanti style solution is that it's very difficult to set it up to capture the settings for your applications, right? Often you have to do each application individually and it's very time consuming, very frustrating. Now configured correctly, it's a great way to do it. But all too often, I always found myself dealing with poorly configured implementations of it, right? And first and second line support jobs of just managing it often had to be done by third line engineers, which could provide could prove quite challenging for organizations. 
So what happened was, because everybody was discovering the limits of these kind of complicated solutions, um, FS Logics came along with a method of profile management that just took the idea behind user profile disks, right, and put a filter driver on it and sprinkled a bit of secret sauce and came up with a thing called FS Logics Profile Containers. Arguably, Liquid, where I might say that they probably had the functionality first, but certainly FS Logics captured everybody's attention. And the, the, the concept's simple, right? The entire user profile is mounted to a network location as a VHD or a VHDX virtual disk. So it was all addressed as a single file, right? And the operating system saw it as a locally attached storage, which was great, right? Because there were no limitations around that. Uh, but you didn't get any log on, log off issues, right? Because if you mount a 30 megabyte VHD or a 300 gigabyte VHD, they take roughly the same amount of time to do it. You can use it with redirected folders. You can get rid of the redirected folders. But it was just the ease of use of it that people loved it. You just captured the entire user profile into a single file and attached it to your session. Very low maintenance. Very little management required. They even came up with a cut down version called Office Container, which let you mount things like OST files and Teams caches and things like that. So that people who already use profile management solutions like Ivanti could just add it on to that and get the benefits. And it soon became really popular, obviously, to the extent where it was actually purchased by Microsoft. There are, however, again, some drawbacks and limitations to it. Obviously, an FS Logics profile is unique to the profile version that we talked about. You can't share them across different operating systems. They tend to use tons of storage because they're meant to, right? They capture that entire profile. And in that respect, and especially in cloud hyperscaler environments, they can become very, very expensive. They've always been sensitive to any latency to the file store. Generally, anything over three milliseconds results in poor performance. They were never really the go-to thing for me in published app environments or environments where users use multiple concurrent sessions, right? Because you generally need exclusive access to virtual disk. And for um, kind of concurrency, you ended up with difference in disks being merged back in at log on and log off. It was, uh, you know, felt quite wasteful and inefficient. There's also replication for DR. And one of the biggest drawbacks, I think, around the FS logics bit was there's never any option to keep local copies of the V-Disks for offline access. I mean, you could manage it to a certain degree with cloud cache, which was buggy at the best of times, but that was never really what the feature was actually intended to do. So that's kind of where we were, where we were at almost, where we arrived today. We've got various solutions, but none of them seem to fit every eventuality, right? But I think it's important just to stop and think quickly about where is that whole user profile heading as a concept. Now, Microsoft have kind of started the move away from the user profile towards the model used by the mobile apps ecosystem, right? So on your mobile device, most of your user settings are held at the back end. And those of them that can't, you can easily back them up or migrate them to the cloud. Now, nowadays, I'm starting to see more and more things that used to sit inside the Windows user profile slowly moving across to cloud backends, right? Things like NK2 files, right? The autocomplete feature in Outlook. They used to sit in the user profile in app data, but now they're part of Office 365 and they roam around with you, which is which is great, you know? So this subscription model that a lot of the big application vendors are pushing is opening up new ways for the user profile to slowly become obsolete. And in a number of years, it'll probably get to the stage where it's almost completely portable. But it's not there yet, right? That those bigger apps can become self-contained more quickly, especially those that use subscription models. But we still do have to deal with that user profile as a requirement, right? Particularly, I think, in larger estates where there's a lot of diverse stuff in there, right? In my job, I have to deal with users on desktops, laptops, thin clients, virtual desktops, virtual apps, different Windows operating systems, even users who combine all of those, right? So how do you manage profiles across all those different personas? And how do you try and keep them as simple as possible and as easy to manage? Now, I know I've seen people, you know, put their requirements down lots of times and they say users should have a user experience that is exactly replicated across all the devices. And I've seen it done, right? I've done it myself. Um, and I remember seeing a guy who got his desktop completely replaced and he was amazed that everything came back exactly how he had it, right? Even the positions his icons were in. And it's cool, right? And it's probably a noble goal. But is it practical, right? Is it even required? What if a user has different apps on different machines, right? I've got one machine here with Hyper-V on it. Now, I wouldn't want that replicated onto my laptop, all the shortcuts for Hyper-V and my VMs, right? Makes no sense. Um, what if your main machine has six monitors and a GPU, and then you go and log on to a thin client, right? Well, why would you want to replicate all that stuff in there when it hasn't got a GPU, it hasn't got six monitors? How, how do you translate the settings between them? You can see what I'm driving at, right? Unless you're specifically working with users on identical virtual desktops with predictable access devices, you don't really need or want to exactly replicate their user profile from device to device. I mean, the user might not even notice if you did it. But certain aspects of roaming, even between disparate devices, are very desirable. For instance, when I log on to my laptop at home, 
I always get my Office 365 most recently used documents. I get my OneNote file updated. And from a productivity perspective, that's brilliant. So you need to try and understand your requirements and hit that happy medium. I mean, for users with non-persistent virtual desktops, right, capturing the whole profile is a good idea, right, because they want a consistent experience because they're hitting different machines every time. Well, if users just use virtual apps, for instance, maybe you just need a little bit of profile management to help it follow them around. You know, how do you do it through different OSs? You know, do you, do you keep them separate or do you try and synchronize some stuff between them? What about persistent de virtual desktop users? Do you keep their profiles low for best performance? But then do you want to provide a backup of their profile in case they have to get a new machine? Or do you back up the full VDI? The, the point I'm trying to make is you need to understand your user working patterns and your application sets to make a good judgment on what you need in terms of profile management. And if you've got a state like the one I work in, it's a good chance you've got a diverse and varied set of requirements in there. So I think with all of this in mind, right, it's probably uh, worth, you know, many of you out there taking a look again at Citrix UPM because for years I was a big advocate of FS Logics because it had lots of features that others in the arena didn't. But now things have changed somewhat. And I'm not really happy to say this. The latest release of FS Logics hasn't been the best. It brought some much needed feature updates. It's the first version of FS Logics I've ever had to roll back because it was a bit unstable. It broke office authentication, which I wasn't wasn't very pleased about. Um when it comes to UPM, I think a lot of people have kind of forgotten about it um, or they've last used it when it was simply a few features ahead of a basic Roman profile. So they're often surprised when, you know, they go to revisit it and they see how far it's come. Now, the thing that's always struck me about, um, about UPM is that it's easy to configure and set up, right? The, the agent is part of the VDA, unless you specifically exclude it. It's driven by policy settings that you can deploy and target through either AD or Civic Studio. And all you need is an SMB file share, whether it's on premises or in the cloud, it doesn't matter. It's like FS Logic, it's pretty straightforward to get it up and running, right? To start saving the profiles and do it. So that's that that side of it hasn't changed. It's not a greatly complicated product to get set up and going. But UPM, I think particularly for this reason, right, is, is worth um, a look these days because it brings us back to this kind of hybrid profile, right? You can now do containers as a version 20 or nine, just like FS Logics, right? But unlike FS Logics, since version 2103, um, UPM has the ability to keep a local cache of your container as well, which FS Logics doesn't. Well, it kind of does with Cloud Cache, but not in the way that it's intended for. So now you can have that container cached and make it you know, ideal for scenarios where the user session needs to be resistant to a network outage to the file share. I haven't actually fully tested this yet. I'm ashamed of it. I only noticed it when I was writing this presentation. I kind of went, oh God, that's a nifty feature. I didn't know it was there. Um, and it only works when UPM is configured to capture the entire container, like FS Logic's profile container. But if this works, as um, I'm hoping it will work, that is a very exciting development. But the whole fact that you can do containers within there now is great. But even if you're not looking at the container-based side, right, um, I've done a deployment recently where we needed the sessions to be resistant to network outages. And UPM has always been able to handle this, right? So if you've got users, even users with multiple sessions where they've got where you've configured it to keep local copies of the profile on those machines, this is the file-based side of the profile, then if you lose that network connectivity, then it'll simply just sync back as soon as the network connectivity is restored, right? And even if you've got multiple sessions, the synchronization and merging engine is clever enough to try and update the settings that were written in whatever session back to that. Obviously, if you change the same settings willy-nilly, then you know you don't know quite what you get on. But generally, it seems to work pretty well in all the testing we did. And that was a pretty um, demanding use case that we that we did. So it's it, it's really, really, you know, it, it's got that functionality. It's always had that functionality to be able to do that. But I think another thing that is drawing me closer and closer towards it now is that UPM gives you that ability to mix file-based settings and container-based settings together, which gives you the best of both worlds. Now, you could do that previously by mixing FS Logics with Ivanti or UPM, right? But you couldn't, you had to blend it together with multiple solutions. But now with UPM, you can do it with a single solution. So we look at the bit at the bottom there where I've got a user session 
And what you can do is you can save some of your settings into the file-based profile, which you can include and exclude from your heart's content, but then you can add specific folders to the container-based solution. Now, unlike FS Logics, which just allows you to save predetermined folders into the container, like OST, OneDrive, Cache, etc., with UPM, you can specify folders that you want to put in the container, right? So in this example here, I save the desktop, the Outlook OST, and the Google Chrome Cache together into that VHD. So they're, you know, they wouldn't impact session performance now currently all of those folders go into a single vhd which my diagram now looks a bit stupid because it seems to suggest there's three different ones i didn't mean to do that currently they're going to a single vhd but i have got a feature request open with sirix to allow them to be saved into individual vhdx files which would be really cool because then you could just reset whichever part of it you wanted by deleting the vhd file you'd have like a layered vhdx solution and also another thing to mention is that UPM now has a setting to save your OneDrive data into a container too, which only FS Logics could do originally. Um, I'm assuming they're using the app layering, filter drive to handle this. I have tested it and it works great, right? So you can now do that OneDrive stuff from within UPM as well. Now, other new features, I mean, containers is probably the, the big one in there because it lets you do that mix and match. But there are other new features as well. One of them is built-in replication. So you can configure a secondary file store and your UPM profiles will be replicated not only to the path that you specify for their primary, but also to multiple additional locations. And so for a failover, really, you can just update the policies, right, to point it to a secondary file store. Or you can even stand up new VDIs in a different location that point to, like, the secondary as a primary, if you say what I mean. There's, there's there's loads of ways you can configure that. So if a file server fails, you know, you can just update the policies. If the data center fails, you can just spin up instances in the other data center and have it because you've got your profiles replicated in this. The replication implementation, I wouldn't say it's perfect yet. I'd like to see it extended so you can have multiple file store paths for the initial connection as well as the, the, the kind of replication. At the minute, the replication only works at log off or constantly in session, right? Um, I'd love to see a third option added to that so it, doesn't have any impact on session performance when it does that replication. So something like sync on session lock, again, I've put a feature request into that. But it's really good. Um, and it also, if you're using the container part of the solution, as well as the file-based part, you can configure the replication to replicate the containers to a different path than the file-based profiles, which is neat. So it could develop a bit more, you know, as we go on. But as we say, we've got replication built in there now. I am using it in some production environments and it works absolutely fine in the tests that we've done so far. There's also deduplication built in. Um, when I first sat and thought about duplicate files in the profile of each user, I was kind of skeptical, but there was somebody I know who deployed this and they said they saved about 52% of their storage, which I found astounding to be perfectly honest. Um, but what happens is it just creates a shared file store under the root where you normally have your user profile stored by username. So if there are any files that are duplicated, it simply saves them into there instead and saves you having that same file replicated across different instances of the user profile. Um, as again, I haven't tested this yet. I don't know how it will behave if the file store went offline. I'm not sure what would happen in that, um, but it would be it is quite a cool feature and I'm looking to get it tested very soon. What would be great if there was some kind of discovery tool attached to it that basically let you identify any possible deduplication savings. And they also the bit that I'm unsure about is how would this work with other dedupe being deployed at a lower level as well, right? So potentially don't know how they would interact with each other. Well, it's something you've got to find out. There's also now in UPM asynchronous GPO support, which was something FS Logic used to have and then broke it and said it wouldn't be coming back. So user group policy processing is done much faster if it's running asynchronous mode, which means your GPO processing simply allows the shell to start before it's finished, but it allows much faster logons. Now, the setting that indicated the next logon was okay to be asynchronous. Used to sit in HK current user, but it then moved to HKLM in a SID um, key deep under group policy. Sort of roam this setting around, you have to capture that SID key from HKLM. As I said, the old version of FS Logic used to do it, but now Citrix UPM can do it. It simply captures that value, saves it into the UPM profile. This is a great feature if you need fast logons. I mean, as far as I'm aware, UPM is the only, UPM is the only profile management tool that can handle it. There are a couple of GPOs you need to configure to be able to do asynchronous anywhere. There's always wait for the network, a computer start and log on. And if you're using RDSH, you need to set the GPO to allow asynchronous user GPO processing. Uh, if you want to go look on my blog, I'm sure I wrote an article about that um, a few years ago now. 
There's also something that I've done in UPM is for cross operating system support, right? For instance, I have a Windows 2012 R2 virtual environment as well as a Windows 10 one, and users were complaining that some of their application settings had to be changed in both of them and things like that, which they found rather annoying. So I'm using UPM containers for both these um, implementations. And if you obviously you're paying attention on the profile version slide, 2012R2 is a version 4 profile, Windows 10 is a version 6. I can't share the settings between them. However, um, UPM has several features that can help with this. And the one I prefer to use is called cross-platform settings, which has been around a while. Everybody tends to forget about it. Essentially, it's just Microsoft UEV, but letting UPM do the business, right? You generate XML files with the UEV generator, handle the file system and registry entries for each app. Then you just leave the rest to UPM. User logs into the virtual desktop, the profiles come across, and then it just sprinkles a little bit of application settings on the top via UPN. So I can roam those application settings effectively between those different operating system versions for the applications that I need. Nice and easy. There is also some integration with FS Logics as well, should you wish to do it like that for concurrent sessions. Um, concurrent sessions, as I said, is one of the things that FS Logics isn't great at. can handle it, but it feels a bit slow and clunky when you get into multiple diff disks and merges. But if you turn on the UPM and FS Logics integration, UPM doesn't do anything unless it detects when you start a session that um, FS Logics has already got a profile mounted in another session. And basically, what happens then is UPM just becomes active and then it saves any changes you make back into a UPM profile. Then, when that session ends, it merges them back into the FS Logics VHDX. So, ideally, this is kind of aimed at users. <coughs> who have FS Logics for their main profile and then maybe some published apps running you know from an old farm or something like that in the background but it is pretty cool right and it works pretty well in that it allows you to get around that overhead of storage and that overhead of login and log out if you want to use fs logics for multiple sessions instead you just use a bit of upm on top and it's a real kill cool feature for people who may be committed to fs logics but just want to improve how it handles the multiple sessions as well there's also some enhancements to profile streaming in UPM. You used to be only able to stream files, but now you can stream folders. And you're basically just loading parts of the user profile on demand when the user accesses them, which is kind of like if you used to. It enhances your logons, it enhances your performance. You can selectively decide what to stream and what not, whether it's the size of the file that differentiates it or what. Um, probably more aimed at published app environments, especially when you're trying to ensure that remote applications launch as quickly as possible. For, for published apps, it makes a lot of sense. So what I love about UPM, and this diagram here is just showing how we configured it to do replication, and we've got some offline backup in there as well, and some reprovisioning using, I think it's rubric across data sets and things like that. But what I love about UPM now in its latest incarnation is how configurable it is, right? There's loads of functionality you can leverage for whatever you require. You can exclude and include as you require. You can mix containers and file profiles together. You can layer custom folders into your containers. You can sprinkle bits of settings across different OS. You can do targeted includes and excludes. You can capture very specific settings or very wide tranches of settings as you need to. It's great for diverse environments with lots of different personas. I mean, I have some users who are non-persistent virtual desktop users with a pretty wide set of apps. So I use the full container with a lot of cash, right? So sorry, I use the full container without a lot of cash. <coughs> I also have some users who are persistent virtual desktop users, right? with a less predictable set of apps. So I use the full container, but I use the lot of caching as well. And then I have other persistent virtual desktop users with heavy U resilience requirements. So I use a full UPM profile with local copies cached, large folders redirected into a container, which is also cached locally and replication of their profiles to a secondary store. I've also got physical laptop users who just want a few settings to roam from their physical devices to the virtual desktop. So I just use a small amount of file-based profile management for that, right? I can skin it anywhere I need to meet my user requirements. What's not hot about UPM, and I'm going to criticize it on it, is a lot of these scenarios you can do things for are very poorly documented. And you have to dig quite heavily into the Citrix website to find how parts of the suite work. And people often don't understand that UPM can help with some of their use cases because the documentation isn't great. Um, I'm hoping to do some, some blogging myself about the things that I've done through. There was a, a great series of artists by Dan Allen about 10 years ago. So I guess it's it's time for an update around that. There's also um, UPM and WEM. It's just worth noticing that UPM and WEM are now tied together in the Citrix sort of product management arena. So you, even though I don't do a lot of it, you can use WEM to configure UPM and all of the settings within there as well. 
So just to finish off with a kind of summary um, of the things that I'm about, is that in the profile management era, I think that especially for medium to large customers is the hybrid profile, that approach is really back, right? You know, to, to meet all of your use cases, you need to do a hybrid approach to profiles. And for those of us in medium to large environments, you've got a diverse set of needs that only a hybrid approach will satisfy. And if you want one product to do it all, then UPM is probably the only one you've got out there. You could use FS Logix plus UAV from Microsoft, but it wouldn't suffice for all your scenarios. The big problem is, though, if I wasn't a Citrix customer, I doubt I could justify the spend on Citrix licenses just to use UPM because it's part of the full Citrix licensing. Might be cool if they, 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 they had just a UPM only license available. I doubt they'll ever do that. So if I wasn't in the market, if I was in the market for a profile solution, but I wasn't a Citrix customer, I'd feel a bit short of options. But if you are a Cirix customer, right, if you've already got Cirix license, I think UPM at the minute is a total no-brainer, right? It makes the most sense for me out of all the options. It does file-based at containers. It does mix and match. It can do local copies. It can do cross OS, It can do lots of use cases. You can configure it so it's hands-on or hands-off. I think it represents the best available profile management option for Cirix customers who have diverse environments and user requirements. And sorry about whistle stopping through that, but as I said, I am on the clock to pick up my kids from basketball, which is uh, always unfortunate. But if there's any questions, I can uh, probably spare you about a minute or so to address them right now. Oh, great, James. If uh, if you can take one question, let's let me throw one at you right now. Uh, yeah, sure. Is OneDrive supported yet on UPM containers? Yes, it is. OneDrive is very much supported. It was in a kind of a preview release, but I believe it's now a full release there now. I was doing the testing of it when it was in preview release, but yeah, it does it now. I'm sure it just uses the app layer and filter driver underneath that. I don't know how good it is at doing concurrent sessions, because um, you know that's one thing that Microsoft saved with FS Logix. We won't support it, even though in certain scenarios you might be able to get it past their support. But yes, I think um, it, as I say, for concurrent sessions, not sure, but definitely fully supported on Citrix UPM at the moment. Yeah. I oh, appreciate that, James. Let's let's make sure you have you have time to <clears throat> pick up your kids. So thank you very much, James. That was a fantastic presentation. We really appreciate you making the uh, adjustments today. Thank you. No problem. Thank you very much. I was good to be here. So we're going to take a short break and allow you to visit Sponsor Boots. All sponsors will be hosting demos in their booths during this time. Please respond to their poll question for a chance to win some awesome prizes. We'll return to the main stage at 11.20 a.m. Eastern time, which is in about 10 minutes. <laughs> 